yes, I'm going to be talking about Ilya Yankov's essay by way of some other broader themes, and then we'll come back to the actual substance of the essay after. Cecilia Dupe, let me see. What is your father? He belongs to the horse riding, if you please, sir. Mr. Gradgrind frowned and waved off the objectionable calling with his hand. We don't want to know anything about that here. Your father breaks horses, don't he? If, if, if you please, sir, when they can get any to break, they do break horses in the ring, sir. Very well, then. Describe your father as a horse breaker. He doctors sick horses. Oh, yes, sir. Very well, then. He is a veterinary surgeon, a farrier and horse breaker. Give me your definition of a horse. Sissy Jupe was thrown into the greatest alarm by this demand. Girl number 20, unable to define a horse, said Mr. Gradgrind, for the general benefit of all the little vessels. Girl number 20, possessed of no facts in reference to one of the commonest of animals. Some boy's definition of a horse. Bitzer, yours. Quadruped, graminivorous, 40 teeth, namely 24 grinders, four eye teeth, and 12 incisors. Sheds coat in a spring in marshy country, sheds hoofs too. Hoofs hard, but requiring to be shod with iron. Age known by barks and mouth. Thus and much more, Bitzer said. Now, girl number 20, said Mr. Grand Grind, you know what a horse is. <laughs> now, th there's a few different messages that we can get from this quite famous extract from Dickens, which I really like because it shows a few conflicting models of education. I think one way to read it is in terms of bits of having the wrong kind of knowledge because the kind of bits of that um, he uh, um, the kind of knowledge that bits has is not knowledge that has any practical application so knowing things like uh, the number of teeth of the horse um, doesn't have any practical applications and um, in my many years of teaching I often heard the complaint from my students why are we learning this I'm never going to use this I don't think that this is the best interpretation because um, what it does is it still plays into one thing that uh, Dickens was worrying about which is treating um, learning as something where the learner is like a container a vessel to be filled with facts um, I think a better um, parallel here is with what Paolo Freire calls the banking model of education where basically um, the knowledge is like money and that money is going to be cashed out in a marketplace so when they say I'm never going to use it what they mean is well I'm going to become a I don't know a businessman a plumber and why am I learning this poem I'm never going to apply this poem to that what we can see from Ilyengov's essays that actually there's still more to the criticism we can't simply say well knowledge ought to be applicable to um, real life there's there's more and we need to actually go a little bit deeper into Ilyenko's own um, arguments here to work out why. Um, so the view which Ilyenko is criticizing, this traditional view, is one in which there are objects in the world and then there are concepts of those objects which I form in the head. So there's a horse in the world and then um, Sissy Jupe didn't have the proper concept of horse, bits that did have the proper concept and what education is about is um, giving children the mental concepts for stuff in the world so that they can correctly label it. Now Kant's version of this is more sophisticated, there's a kind of a common sense intuitive understanding and there's also a Kantian one but nonetheless if we do have this um, two worlds interpretation of Kant where we have the things in themselves and then we have uh, the phenomena of those things we still have this sort of separation um, which Ilyenkov wants to criticize okay so now in terms of pedagogy what's wrong with that I want to bring it to a more modern uh, example 
uh, in terms of my own work. So my field is called personal informatics. Um, I'm looking at data uh, which people collect about themselves, data which teenagers collect about themselves specifically. And this is a kind of perfect example, actually, of a lot of what um, Ilyankov is criticizing. So here we have on the left someone collecting data about their mood, about the number of steps they take, about their online activity, and then later they reflect on that data. Um, so how is this thought of within my field of personal informatics within human computer interaction? Well, a popular model is something like this. So I'm picking out one specific model, but this is just really the um, hegemonic view, where what you have are insights that are made from data. The point of the data is that they generate insights and then you extract facts from the data. And um, in this paper, the author suggests there are three stages here. Stage one is you see patterns, relationships or anomalies in the data. Then you apply mental models to those patterns, relationships or anomalies. And through that, um, you are um, sorting facts. So the facts are in the patterns and then the mental model uh, uh, makes the facts serviceable. And then you use the facts, evaluating them by way of the model. Um, to simplify, um, basically, uh, the idea is that the data vi vi visualization triggers insights in me. So the point of a visualization is um, by visually seeing something about myself, um, I am imprinted with knowledge about it. This is not just the case in my pretty niche field of personal informatics. It's also more broadly the case in education. So these are diagrams I remember from my own um, school days. Um, so in the sort of heyday of visual learning, the overhead projector was a great innovation because suddenly you could um, show all kinds of images to a class, uh, educational breakthrough. And I remember this diagram on the left very well um, because what I would do in an exam is I would um, either be given this diagram with lots of the elements missing and I would have to label, okay, reduction zone, central zone, fusion zone, combustion zone, in that order, um, RCFC, or I would have a question like, um, from what is the cup cone arrangement composed? Oh, it is composed of ore, coke, and lime. But I have no idea what this is a diagram of. I, I if, if you ask me, like, what do I understand it? No, I really don't. Um, I just remember that ore, coke, and lime compose the bit at the top. Um, so this is an image that has already received its citizenship in the world of language. There, there are specific things which I meant to say about it, and there's a constant exchange between an image in this form um, and um, kind of what I meant to do um, with that image. Um, the same thing happens with uh, something like a visualization of my steps. So, okay, I've, I've done 7,000 steps. What does that mean? Well, I know I need to do 10,000 steps, so that means I need to do um, about another 3,000 steps. And this is a back and forth that I get locked into between the image and the knowledge that the image is meant to give me. So, okay, what do we do to break out of that? Um, there is some image, there is some value, of course, in images. Images are very powerful. My, my own presentation is full of images, but um, what are they then doing if they're not a way to um, give me a more accurate representation for things in the world? Um, I'm working in the project, so before this I was in Brixton in South London, um, installing a home energy monitor and interviewing someone in their home. And we're interested in um, getting people to think about solar energy and how they can coordinate um, so solar energy in their community. And they're collecting their electricity data and they can see their own electricity data and they label it to say, okay, well, here's my, here's where I was 
are doing laundry, here's where I was cooking. Um, and then we're inter interested in later how they're going to share their solar energy if they buy a um, solar panel together. Um, one thing that my colleague did was to um, 3D print this graph and then bring together different people coordinating their energy. And the question which I've been kind of agonizing about, maybe you've got ideas about it as well. Um, suddenly, when you go from a graph on the screen to having these blocks, which are called physicalizations of the data, a lot more learning happens. So why would it be that um, the 3D printed blocks are better than um, these ones? Well, why not? answer I've seen in literature is that well it's because of extended cognition so you're thinking through this thing but like both of these are external artifacts why would it be that I can extend it through this visual image or I can extend it through this block what would be the difference there um, usually pe people say well like I, well of course it would be like when it's a block it's kind of real that's very unhelpful as well I mean like of course this is real in the same way I think Ilyenkov really helps us to understand why the 3D printed blocks are better. Now, it's very helpful as well because he points out it's it's not just you can't say well they're physical because like if you just have some counting sticks that you're using to count, then you're still kind of repeating the same old stuff and actually there's no new knowledge gained that you wouldn't that that isn't just about like learning um, habits and rote learning. What happens is like the reason why it feels like well the blocks are real and they're here is because of the way in which it brings it into the world around me that i'm tuned into there's all of these kind of capacities abilities things that i can do with this physical block i am tuned into the world in certain ways or it has certain moves that are available to me and I bring the data into re relations that I'm already um, uh, oriented to, familiar with, um, have control over, have um, experience over. And the other thing that happens that's very important here is they, the way in which it enters into my social relations with others. So now the data visualization is also in social relations, but that kind of the fetishism there is kind of hidden. Whereas here it's like right there and physically being able to point to the blocks, move them around. Suddenly they're making actual discoveries. They're learning because they're like, oh, if I put your data on top of my data, then we can both do our laundry on Wednesday. Um, but actually probably on the Thursday, um, no one's able to do it and and these kind of things happen because you're actually not just looking at the data here it is i'm there's this interface between me and data but you're transforming something through the data you're actually um creating something new really you're creating a new type of graph and then suddenly it's part of our activity it's part of our negotiation you can say hey um you shouldn't be um doing all your baking at um, 9 p.m. on a Sunday, um, if we want to um, be more ec um, ecologically mindful, for example. Um, so yeah, this is in an upcoming paper. This isn't out yet. I, I wasn't part of the project at this stage. Hopefully, um, yeah, in future I can bring in a little bit of Ilyenkov into this. So the traditional model is one where um, there's me, that, and there's the world, and then. Knowledge is almost this sort of interface between me and the world. So Ilyankov is saying something quite radical in his philosophy. He's saying, no, knowledge isn't this third um, that's in our head. We need to um, get rid of that. Um, the me is already the way that the world is structuring me. So the knowledge is already included. It comes along for free. Because the knowledge is already my orientation to the world. My orientation to the world is just already the, the me. I am shaping the world. The world is shaping me. And this interchange, the, the stance, the orientation, the 
of audiences that are opened up by the world um, is the knowledge. So and in summary, um, there's no isolated knowledge of the apple to correlate with real apples. Um, it isn't something which is like an item we um, can um, pick off. So like there's nothing in, in addition that I can uh, cleave off to say, ah, here's um, the knowledge of the apple. Here's the fact. I can't isolate it. So here's the fact. Here it is in, in your head. Um, what we have is knowledge as assimilation of dynamic systems that are um, around us, that are um, in the world. Uh, it, it's about attuning to objects and their relation to other objects in particular environments. Um, so I think the kind of radical move here is if you think, what do we mean by you having knowledge? So um, all of you know that this meeting is happening on earth. All of you know that um, we're watching this meeting um, using our eyes. Now, okay, where was that knowledge? It, was it um, there sitting in your head? Um, I don't think there is any part of your brain where we find the knowledge of this meeting being on earth. Instead, as a description, it's a description of facts of the world. And we only really, that, that description of the world only comes to be a representation in my head as an individual when we um, in, um, in, interact with it in our activity as a contradiction. So me just bringing it to mind created a, a contradiction. Or if I said, um, oh, so, okay, for example, if we um, saw into um, Karina's room and we saw the view through the window and through the window, we saw up there in the sky was earth. Then we would suddenly like our knowledge about this meeting being on earth um, would be something that's represented um, to us. So really what happens when we have knowledge is there some sort of transformation of the environment or um, transformation of our stance, transformation of what we're continuously doing and the way in which we allow the environment to affect us, what we see as available moves in that environment. And one thing I haven't had time for because I'm about to wrap up is that this is something that's necessarily um, social. It's not just knowledge isn't just in a world in the sense of like brute facts. It's, it, it is about a transformation of our social relations. Um, Ezekiel de Paula, who was one of the um, keynotes at our Ilyenkov conference, he sends his apologies. He did want to make it tonight um, together with um, Anna de Jager and Elena Kafari, of uh, course, this participatory sense making. So we have to together orient the world in certain ways. And we create these together, these certain niches, these certain practices, this activity for dealing with the world. And that's really where um, knowledge is. Um, I, I just want to end with a criticism of Ilyenkov's essay. I think one, it's possible to read it. There's one, there's one thing that it, that it isn't. So within learning theory, there's this popular thing of, um, well, there's these different learning styles that everyone has. Some people prefer um, to be, some people are visual learners, some people are audio learners, some people are kinesthetic learners. So it sounds like the end of saying, audio learning is bad, visual learning is bad, let's all go with kinesthetic learning. Uh, and it's all, it's, it's true that for me as a teacher, whenever people talk about learning styles, it always turns out that they were a kinesthetic learner. No one says, I, was, I wasn't able to learn because it took, turns out I was an audio learner. Um, I, I think there's like problems with that. The, the, the point is that we, we can't, we can't uh, separate these. Um, that's, that's one problem, but I, I don't think Ilyankov is saying we can separate them. He's just saying, we, he is saying we need to integrate them. Or he's not saying visual is bad, for example. I, I do think there's a danger of falling into the romantic view um, where um, book learning and rationality is bad and practical learning directed by the world is good. So I've got on the left here, his 
Hubert Dreyfus, who's a proponent of this kind of um, romantic and Heideggerian view. Um, and he, Ilyenkov invites that when he says, well, he basically separates that as, as like, all true learning is outside the classroom. I, maybe it's because I was a classroom teacher for 12 years, but I, I don't particularly like that. Maybe, maybe we can talk about that. Uh, I, 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 Ilyenkov certainly doesn't have the Heideggerian view because his point is that the conceptuality is already in the activity. It's not that knowledge is um, simply disclosed to us by the world. It's in our rational engagement with the world that, um, we, we, that we come to know. Um, yeah, I haven't talked at all about um, the essay in terms of his engagement with um, Carnap philosophy and uh, in terms of philosophy of science, empiricism, that sort of stuff. But if you, if, if we want to come back to that afterwards, uh, we can certainly do that. Um, okay, so I'm going to stop sharing. And exit. Thank you very much, Carol. That was very helpful. Um, and bringing it into contemporary practice as well, and what the way people are tracking their own oh. movement. Thank you for that. Um, and welcome to the people who came a little bit late who may have missed the first few minutes. Um, but with the discussion, we can bring all that out again, hopefully. Um, so uh, opening up for any questions, any points to Carol or points to each other or points to Elenko if he was here. <laughs> George. You're muted, George. Unmute, unmute okay. Yeah, you're fine. Okay. You're fine. okay. Um, I'm going to ask a question as a kind of traditional philosophy, philosopher of science, in fact, a realist of a certain sort. Now, I understand the Lienkov's point, or whoever made it, that knowledge is a transformation of our relations. I, I understand that, I think. My point is this, uh, if I, if my knowledge is transformed and I'm, let's say, studying physics, I can learn that there are such things as electrons or whatever. And where does that come in in this analysis? Thank yeah, sure. Go ahead. I, I, I mean, quite simply that, um, to well, I, I'm, I'm happy for someone else to answer it, but for me, it's just that uh, to learn that there are electrons is to uh, be able to engage in activity uh, that's related to um, learning about um, electrons. Uh, like it's, it allows, it gives me certain moves I can make um, with respect to electrons. So it's still a kind of um, placing of objects with respect to other objects. Well, okay, but um, you're acknowledging the existence of those objects, which the literal formulation of Ilyenkov's third or fourth final thesis doesn't at all. It, it, no, it, that's exactly what it's doing. So he's rejecting the idea that you just have, so the, the very thing it's against is the, um, well, he, he assigns it to Carnap, but even like Derrida, there is no outside the text or um, what, what McDowell, calls the um, frictionless spinning in the void. He's, he's specifically not saying you've just got knowledge about other knowledge and it's uh -huh. an infinite loop. He's, he's directly saying, no, that there are electrons. So um, okay. we, we have certain relations to electrons because they are real and, we've, and we approach them in certain ways through our practices. Oh, that's okay. Yeah, but I, I think George, if I may uh, come in here, is pointing to uh, something you, uh, Kirill, already uh, made clear in his criticism of uh, Yelienkov. Um, and this creates a kind of ambiguity, namely, um, if uh, Yelienkov says that um, kind of textbook uh, uh, knowledge is only knowledge about phrases, right? This was your criticism, Kirill, right? Then, then of oh. course, the uh, question uh, 
uh, emerges, uh, but how did the, did these phrases got formulated and yeah, get right. into the textbook, right? I think this is what you uh, address yeah. here uh, as well. I think um, that's a good uh, question, but it's not addressed by uh, Ilyenkov. And I think we have to keep in mind that this is a kind of occasional writing in a, in a certain context. So it's not giving a full picture. Mm -hmm. I think uh, Kirill uh, acknowledged that. Uh, and um, in this respect, still, um, it's interesting how um, close Ilyenkov comes, at least for me now, from a philosophical perspective, to formulations of, of the pragmatists. Not only in terms of education, you, you immediately think of Dewey, right, uh, with this kind of, of education method, uh, learning by doing, um, but also in terms of epistemology. Yeah. Um, so, it, um, for example, Ian Hacking has this uh, concerning now the electron sets this form formulation, if you can spray it, then they are real, so to say. I'm not thinking that's a very good formulation, but it at least hints at a, at a kind of pragmatist uh, principle that it's in the use that we in the end can also, uh, first of all, get knowledge, but then also confirm knowledge. But what is in between, that's a, that's a whole different kind of world which is not addressed uh, by Ilyenkov here at all. I think mm -hmm. the core issue, we don't have to go into that now, but just to close with this sentence, the core issue of this problem is really in the, in the first uh, sentences but um, Yankov is not emphasizing it enough. It's the word application. What does that mean? That's actually his, <laughs> that's, that's his problem. What does it mean to apply knowledge? What does application mean here? But we can come back to that. There are others who want to say yeah. something. Thank you. It's Sigurd and then Andrew is after him. What's me? Sigurd is next and then Andrew. Yeah. Okay. Oh, it's uh, <clears throat> very nice. Uh, I'm a little, um, my voice is a little bit affected by the cough. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, it's nice to uh, finally have the chance to join this webinar uh, according to my schedule. And it was a very nice introduction, Kirill. Thank you. And, uh, uh, but I, um, as you, you didn't go into what I understand as the main point in this article which is the, the, the criticism of uh, positivism. Uh, and um, I, my, my, my thought, would, which I would like to share is that, I mean, uh, the, I, I, I have myself uh, fulfilled half, one and a half year of uh, uh, teach, uh, um, training as a teacher for the Norwegian school. <laughs> so I'm a finally qualified teacher. Uh, and been going to these seminars and 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 uh, preparing myself, uh, and I, I have got very acquainted with the new um, curriculum for the Norwegian um, basic school. And what is very interesting when you read this uh, article is that um, there is a new concept which is very popular in Norway. We are proud about it because we think we have invented it ourselves. Uh, we call it deep learning. Deep learning. Uh, in, in contrast with the superficial learning, which the school have been doing. And it has been implemented in the Norwegian curriculum uh, this, uh, as a goal that we should uh, deal with deep learning. But the question is, what is deep learning? And it has to do, of course, with the application uh, that, that uh, what you learn in school should be applied. Um, but it was very interesting, I mean, to see that, um, this um, uh, views and this analysis, which uh, um, Ilenkov presents in this article from 74, is very absent in, in the discussions, in the perspective. That was very fascinating about this article. 
so it goes straight into the very central uh, problem of how we think about uh, school in Norway today. And I, I, I uh, but 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 uh, we lack these kind of concepts. We lack this perspective, uh, and 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 that is of course due to our to us being. Uh, uh, in this still being in this positivist tradition, <laughs> thinking in a positivist manner. Uh, so this is what is so interesting with uh, this text, with this uh, perspective, which is presented in this article and many more articles. I've been happy to, uh, a few years ago, uh, translating a later essay, some later essays by Ilenkov, um, because I am uh, in conduct of the Russian and it's uh, it's this uh, of learning to think when you, while you're young. I think it was uh, written in '78, uh, a very late essays, which is um, uh, well, it's about the, uh, the 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 experiments with the deaf and blind and and so on. Mm -hmm. So this is a very central uh, thing in in Ilenkov's um, philosophy, as I understand, uh, and. Um, um it is extremely uh, actual uh, and and we need to talk about and understand uh, what he means with this criticism of positivism his his verbalism uh, uh, we need the words of course of electron apple horse <laughs> but it's uh, all about uh, the application yeah, as as uh, sasha uh, mentioned uh, that uh, yeah. I Thank think Andre, Andre is, is next, but Andre, if you allow uh, just uh, to, uh -huh. to comment okay. on this. Speak, Sasha, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think the last point is, is uh, important, uh, not, not, not uh, um, only to emphasize the problem of application, but what does it mean that there's only a, a, a words? Uh, of course, Ilyenkov uh, is the last, and we all read the ideal. I mean, he's he's the one emphasizing like the symbolical means uh, for uh, dialectical materialism uh, a lot, right? So it would go totally against his own conception to uh, downplay that. I think the whole thing here has a political meaning. So uh, this is why I wanted to comment on this directly because you brought it in, you're right. What's the curriculum, uh, national curriculum like? It's, it's a political thing. And I was reminded while uh, you were speaking of uh, Merleau-Ponty's humanism and terror. If, uh, if uh, some of you did not make, read it, please do just the first, two pages, just the two pages. And uh, Melo Pont, what Melo Ponti does is complementary to um, Ilyenkov, but explaining the whole political uh, significance of what we are talking about here with this essay. Um, he says that um, West, the Western countries are criticizing the Eastern Bloc because they uh, use lies and violence in their political um, everyday <laughs> dealings, so to say. And the communists, so to say, um, like the socialist bloc answers, you are doing the same, but you call it differently. And I think that's uh, what uh, Ilyenkov is uh, trying to uncover but in a universal sense, not in terms of uh, blocks, uh, liberal versus uh, socialist, but in terms of a modern modern world, this kind of camouflage uh, and, and cover up of problems in, in by uh, so-called language, by repeating phrases. I mean, in the Soviet Union, you were, were trained very well in that as well. So I think this we have to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. When we talk about the critique of positivism here, is is a very Soviet affair as well. I mean, you got to let Andrews get in now, Sasha. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I will start. You know, because this this critic of positivism or no positivism, in my way, 
it was a kind of uh, my own personal experience because I, I am chemist from my per first uh, degree. I, as I was technician, you know, technician technologist on my secondary school. You know, very old school communist way of of schooling. You know, with the pipes and this 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 kind of equipment. And then I went to to study, and I started uh, chemistry at the university. And when I was completely annoyed on the first year. Because the because it was kind of a bookish, you know, we have a lectures, we have a kind of a, I will show you, you know, I was technologist, you know, I know how to create the process of technology of chemistry. And then I have to sit and watch this kind of diagrams. And I was completely bored to death because, you know, I was learning to do the pipes, you know, to use the knowledge. And then I switched to philosophy on, on, on the way and I started to be philosopher. And then I went to the philosophy of science and it was taught by Jan Such. And Jan Such was quite prominent uh, Marxist in Poznan, quite good guy. Uh, he was study physics and philosophy in Leningrad. And, but he was this kind of old school Engelian slash positivist Marxist, not Engelian slash Spinozian <laughs> Marxist. And then I was completely bored again because I really don't understand what he's talking about. You know, it is not my science. You know, my science was like a cooking tomato soup is my favorite example when I talk to my students that being a chemist is a most sophisticated way of cooking chemist uh, tomato soup. We are just using the more, more tools and more chemist uh, ingredients, but the thing is the same, you have to fill it. And then, you know, reading this text, I, I, I am at home because I understood this, you know, because without an action, and then Kirill, this is, you know, I put a little bit early this text about doppelganger and and self mm -hmm. self movement, because you already five minutes later you say that exactly the same, and then when I started to read hacking Latour, embodied cognition, then you know this distributed cognition, and this an activism tradition connected with people all for example, I uh, I started be at home. I started with, oh, already at university they find out what I did when I was, you know, having 17 years and now I'm cooking, cooking chemistry, like cooking math in the breaking beds. For example, I don't know, you know, like when I want to show my students that I'm human, I'm just putting the, my finger in the nitrolyt acid, I guess in English. Nitrolyte, yes, the HNO3. And then if this is yellow, it means I am made from the, uh, you know, I am not, not the robot, yes, because I have this peptide reaction to this AC, yes. And this is this way of thinking. And then I, when I read Ilyenkov, and for example, I feel at home already. This is why I was so jumped by the Di Paolo paper, even if this text paper was not really Ilyenkov's paper, it was just, you know, a little bit pointing at the end of that, mm -hmm. but I have this thing that then I at home. But what I have two questions because I think that the end of is the let's say child of the 70s of this kind of a bookish way of I think that my university in Poznan was in this way very Soviet one, you know, with this way of, of, of having lecture. But I have the question, a little bit mentioned by Kirill, I think it was Kirill who mentioned Dreyfus, that I have a problem with this simple simplification that the books and the hands, because when I write article about my watch, the, the runner's watch, when I did my first marathons and then ultra and whatever, I realized that I never think about data in this kind of positivist way. I just think about cybernetic loops as a kind of, you know, when this watch has this kind of, you know, is vibrating, for example, on this kind of things. I just was thinking about this as a part of myself. And I have this, like in this text, that it was on the beginning kind of the doppelganger, double me. But then using this, it was like putting this together, this strange guy made from data and my flesh was you know making from the cartesian start data separate and body separate then i started to be one body one electronic flesh body of course addicted to the electronic slash corporate uh, data production which is kind of a 
annoying and strange thing. And this is one of my questions, is that this kind of a process, which I think it is in Dreyfus, and Dreyfus, is, I think, is not as romantic as, I don't know, once mentioned, that maybe this is not against books, but only this is pointed that without embodiment, knowledge doesn't work. And this and the second question is Ilyenkov against Ilyenkov. Because, you know, I didn't know Ilyenkov and I cannot discuss with Ilyenkov, but when I read the Polish translation of the... Uh, lo the dialectical logic. It was a book where I lived with, you know, I really, I lived with book, you know, I was moved, I was moving on the chair, I was walking with this book, I was discussing with my head, you know, I was, the, the meanings, philosophical meanings, they were traveling in my head. And for me, there are, there are objects. I don't have to move things to think. I move this thing without my thinking. And then how to translate this experience to this text that I really, I am moving. I have, you know, the, the Ilyenkov ideas of objects. Uh, I don't need to have a piece of Ilyenkov concept in my hand. I really think about them as a 3D. I never think about them as a representation of the world. I, it was for me always like in laboratory, I was using hands to use pipes and whatever. Then I treat my thoughts when I read the end of books. Yes, it, as mm -hmm. uh, because you know I still mentioned dialectical logic because for me it was like the first book of Lienkov. Maybe because it was in Polish, it was of, of course much closer than in English or Russian. And then when I lived with these books, then you know reading other texts was never again as the same. You know, you know, the first when you encounter someone and you have this wow, I am in love, you again, then you say, okay, there's there's no such again this kind of <gasps> thrill. And mm -hmm. but they I feel it, I feel the object, philosophical object. And this is a little bit how to translate this experience to this text. Sorry, okay. So, Maybe too thanks. long. Thanks. Yeah, that's that, that's really interesting, really, really helpful. So first just a Quick anecdote, um, I used to listen to Travis's lectures uh, because they were posted um, on you know, some website anyway, and he explains in one lecture how he trusts Henry Kissinger far more than Chomsky on Vietnam because Chomsky just reads newspapers, whereas Henry Kissinger got stuck in, and that's real knowledge. So, uh, but more, more seriously, if you read the debate between um, Travis and McDowell, uh, the point that um, in in Dreyfus's model, you've got this, you've got these two flaws. You've got um, a, a level of solicitations and affordances, and then afterwards, you've got rationalization of your own um, activity. Um, and he even talks about things like uh, because of knowledge, you you choke, it interrupts your activity. There's breakdown as a result of that. So Ilyenkov is not that. Um, of, of course, yeah, there's all kind of the skill the skillful coping that we're talking about but i think we, you can do all of that through um Ilyenkov through to to paolo and an activists um without having to uh, go down the heidegger route but okay so while I, while i agreed with you and the, the criticism of like books bad outside the classroom good nonetheless let's think where this comes from which is um marx talks about the separation of head and hand is something that happens under capitalism. So um, Alfred Tenriefel as well talks about, look, intellectual and manual labor, how did that come about? Well, partly it came about because he has this focus on the representations, the, the image of um, everything, that we've got these systems that have separated head and hand. So were we to overcome all of these um, bad forms of alienation and the capitalist reification engines, um, then the book would just be um, manual labor. It's um, when the reification goes badly that this happens, but there's also reification that, 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 that can go well, and that's very much in Ilyenko, something he focuses on a lot, why he um, always uses language as uh, an example of um, what should be happening in structuring our social practices and, and our knowledge. So yes, there's a form of verification, but it can go very badly when it's built up into these oppressive 
top-down dictatorial systems that we've talked about earlier, but it but it's also necessary. It's what makes us um, human and allows rationality per se. Thanks, Carol. Um, I think Sasha wanted to speak, but um, is it okay, Sasha, if I just put in a word? Um, yeah, I, I got I I got what you said, Carol, about this slight. Um, it's possible to kind of misinterpret or Ilyenko in the sense that he's just talking, he's poo-pooing book knowledge. I don't think he's poo-pooing book knowledge, although it can be read in that way. Um, I think he, his emphasis is that we have knowledge of something. It's not knowledge of words or knowledge, knowledge of something we've been told, but we knowledge is of something. And this way of teaching prevents people from understanding that it, it's a bar it becomes a barrier instead of a connection what you the method is that you have you can only see what you've been told to see but not what you actually see mm. so in that, in that sense I, I would I agree with you know it's it's an attack it is an attack on positivism because in the sense that uh, and and on linguistic reduction linguistic reductionism that everything is just we only get data, we don't get the thing itself. Or we can't get, we can never reach the thing itself. I think it's a, a really passionate um, emphasis on that our sensate, that we, we do sense real, you know, we do have a direct sense of reality. It's not just something that we get through a, a screen of data. I think that's what he's emphasizing. But I, I, mm -hmm. I, I thought, was, you know, I think, it's quite important to take this to, to this essay together with Ilyenko's other work on the ideal because, because he emphasizes that the ideal phenomena or ideal things are real, they're objective. Therefore, when he says with knowledge of something, that something also includes concepts, includes ideas. That's also knowledge of something, other people's ideas. We're, we're learning something about something not about language but uh, that's all i meant to say <laughs> um i think sasha wanted to speak, but maybe this yeah, great great no uh, absolutely uh, <clears throat> i i totally agree i think uh Ilyenkov is a little bit in a strange uh, situation in this um article and uh, that makes it maybe also a little bit more um not uh, explicitly but implicitly polemic because as you pointed out, and we already mentioned before, he's, he's the philosopher who actually uh, wants, I mean, especially in the, in the Marxist-Leninist context to emphasize most how we emancipate with these ideal forms. So uh, just like Marx uh, said to, uh, so to say, um, in a virtual conversation answer to Hegel, well, this process of uh, emancipation uh, if emancipation is hindered because we have to stay at the level of uh, alienation. Now, uh, Ilyenkov says um, the same happens with symbolic formation. This is what you mean or can can happen. This is what you mean when, when, when you say language can be a hindrance instead of a kind of motivation to inquire. And that's, uh, I think, uh, the problem here. I know, I know it already. I don't have to see it for myself. I think that's uh, what, what he means because this is what can be a pseudo, pseudo, pseudo knowledge, of course. Otherwise, I totally agree also with uh, what, what Kurel said. Uh, that's, I think, what he described before. Um, I think Peirce uh, called it a hypostatic abstraction all kinds of abstraction processes uh, can end in an alienation in just abstraction, right? But without a, this kind of processes, we, we would not uh, be able to uh, become thinking beings, thinking bodies, as, as uh, <laughs> Ilyenko said. Thanks, yeah. I'm, I'm curious whether anyone has any of their own opinions to explain why it is that um, so uh, yeah, just uh, in my example, but but more broadly. So 
literally I have the same data on the screen and then it's printed off and on the screen you don't learn from it um, and then I print it off and then suddenly people learn from it so, so I've been struggling to actually conceptualize that so well, I, I wonder if anyone has an opinion on that and then the, we, we can also if people want to talk about the um, what he means by the criticism of Carnap just very roughly in, uh, in terms of yeah, positivism. What Carnap wanted is a logical system where any phenomena that occurs, he has it, it can kind of fit somewhere in the system. So you've got like a, a way of accounting for um, anything that can occur, both phenomenologically and in terms of like processes. So it's a, it's a logic where like everything is accounted for ahead of time. Um, and Ilyenkov isn't the only one to see this as idealism kind of very interesting figure re resisting um, fascism in Austria initially so he's actually started this project because he was against Heidegger uh, like not Heidegger but fascist romanticism um, although he had a debate with Heidegger eventually um, but then what he, he moved to America and it kind of got absorbed into capitalism um, very easily and yeah he's a um, into Mac and Avenarius, so interesting figure. But yeah, so I, either on that, or if anyone else has an opinion about this, is what exactly what I'm trying to understand now. Why why would um, like printing something off suddenly change it? Whether I learn from it. Um, so maybe just Sigurd before back to Andre. Well, only to, <clears throat> uh, it's, uh, I agree, it's uh, very puzzling, but uh, I mean, uh, in this article, Ilyenkov uh, puts it very clear uh, that um, uh, um, uh, when we're talking about reality, we talk about the chaos. It's a chaos. So uh, the, the tragedy is that you cannot, um, the positivistic tragedy is that the, you cannot uh, reproduce this chaos uh, formally, logically, with this, uh, with these verbs, verbalisms, and 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 he talks about, he writes about the contradiction. I mean, the the attempt to to eradicate the contradiction, uh, and when you have these uh, forms, these uh, diagrams on on the screen, it's uh, it's you're you're still ver verbalizing it. <laughs> And, and you get this illusion that uh, there is some kind of um, harmony here. Uh, you're not, you're, you're in this, uh, this uh, uh, fictional <laughs> verbalized uh, reality, but when you get them printed out uh, and, and you start uh, elaborating them with the hands, uh, you are dealing directly with uh, the chaotic uh, reality. Even though, even though, um, uh, it's just as um, intuitive and, and 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 straightforward as in in the screen, but but you have uh, transcended uh, the, um, the the verbalism and and you deal with reality uh, <clears throat> and and, uh, and this is an example uh, of um, I mean describing this reality um, uh, as Elenke uh, does. Is so extremely important and uh, and, and fruitful, and and uh, and uh, and you have to, and, and uh, very seldom, I think, <laughs> in in our uh, cultural context. <laughs> Thank you. That's very interesting. Thanks. You. Uh, and I think because when I when I for example have this. Uh, fragment of Lienko. In general, we obtain the well-known program of neo-positivism with its uto utopian hopes of erecting system of rules and blah 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 blah. And I think we have like a at least three layers. Like one, it is not articulate explicitly, but it's discussion about the orality and uh, what the written language and writing uh, is doing as a medium. And this is not explicitly said here. But for example, following Kill and this discussion about an activism, we know that an activist now it's quite easier to grasp because we are somehow outside of this uh, uh, writing-centered academia. 
and it means that it's easier to articulate this cognitive approach or because a little bit all imagination is changed. And of course, somehow Ilyenkov, I think, implicitly is trying to discuss with this, because if you think about his involvement in the education of the deaf pupils and so on, I think he has this kind of sensitivity of the media and relation between the media and the mind. But I think it's a little bit implicitly or kind of on the intuition level. And then this is somehow intertwined with this its own political battle with no positivism, which was quite visible if this, in this uh, letter written to the party. I don't know this letter about the no positivation of the of the Soviet philosophy. And I think these two levels intertwined. And this is a little bit misleading, but because somehow Ilyenkov is having his in, in all intuition about the medium of the knowledge and meaning of the medium, and then no positivism is bad because it's kind of a not the no positivist are just re, this is a reification of the one stage of the media, media mediatization of the philosophy it means they they just uh, started to be amazed by the mathematician uh, tools which are available at this time and they became blind because of this and yeah. then this is other part. This is Ilyenkov fight with the now positivists on this political level, and then following this, I think uh, having this, then this bookish versus practice division is a little bit false, because it's more like about contextualized knowledge and then the contextualized knowledge, and then the up now positivism of both side is blamed because it's a tool which is cutting off reality from the knowledge and decontextualizing this, but not in this way. And this is Kirill why uh, I have this hope with Dreyfus, which will false a little bit, because in the approach of the Dreyfus, we also have a think about the decontextualization of uh, the recontextualization of knowledge, but in this romantic, dangerous way. Yes. And this is why I have this hope that Dreyfus a little bit was for me similar, similar, but I am now retreating from this. And this is a uh, last sentence. This is just cruel anecdote because I hate analytical philosophy. Sorry. You know, I always hate analytical philosophy because I as a chemist, I know, because now I forgot, but I know the metaphysical tools much more to reach out than any analytical theory, you know, that, and this is why I was always like, you know, learn the math, guys. But again, for example, when we think about ethics, and then we are closer to the Sasha and the politics and this text, which is a little bit not visible on across. And when you have this famous examples from the analytical ethics, like the troll, 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 troll problems, you know, like to have to put the trolley on and the people on the tracks and then you crush them or not. This is always the Eichmann examples. You know, this is like kind of a sadistic mind that you are <laughs> cutting people from the world, putting people on the virtual track, putting them to the track and then trying to roll over them with the trolley and this is ethical dilemma only for Eichmann, only for guy who is not showing the real example for the real people. And then this my a little bit cruel mocking of the analytical film <laughs> showing us what is hidden, but not exactly hidden, but very visible in the other Inyankov text, quite political ethical dimension of this context uh, dialect, let's say contextual knowledge means dialectical to be honest but but i was have to say around to 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 approach this okay sorry i was a little bit long um after after we take george it would be great to give an opportunity to anyone who hasn't said anything uh to either do a comment or a question either about practical things to do with learning in classroom mm -hmm. practice or something about the Enkos text but george first yeah okay all right. Um, I'd like to make two points. One about Kyle's um, assertion 
about the screen versus the actual practice of removing something into thick air or something. Um, I thought that was pretty funny, Kyle, because you and I were trained on paper, not screens. So I mean, I think the answer is pretty simple. That it's, it's a new experience for you. George, and, it, it, could it, you it, just, George, could you repeat? The, I think yeah, the microphone. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Breaking up a bit. Oh, I, I know what it is. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, it's better. Yeah. Okay. Um, Kyle pointed out two kinds of experience. One when he reads something on a screen, yeah. say Ilyankov, and then suddenly it becomes, let's say, a graph with movable blocks. Yeah. Now he, Kyle and I were trained on paper, not screens. So some kind of shock is expected. I don't know quite how to describe this, but a difference in experience. Mm -hmm. I certainly yeah. have it in, in really intensely. That's why so I just wanted to mention that the answer might be very simple. Yeah. We didn't have to go on to abstract epistemology. But mm -hmm. also then second point about what uh, Mr. No uh, Mr. Novak said about analytical philosophy. As an analytical philosopher, I'm not going to get angry, but I want to point out about Carnap and Ilyenkov that at that time when, let's say 1970, Carnap was still entrenched in a kind of axiomatic view of language that's abandoned now, partly because of efforts of people like Ilyenkov to make it more pragmatic. Um, so I could I could see a I could see a uh, contrast there that would excite Ilyenkov in, in his work. Reading I, I don't know which essay actual essay he referred to, and I don't know what he means to say, well, neo-positive is this, etc. I, I don't know. I do know the entire context uh, from, from the history, but that would uh, maybe simplify talking about what, what Olyankov is reacting against. And he was right. He was absolutely right. Uh, but also the second point was the uh, social context at that time was that the axiomatic view of language would solve all of the Elyankov type problems. They, they weren't unaware of this. Uh, and their own tradition was strictly axiomatic, mostly by Carnap, uh, Tarski, Wesniewski, and being impressed by the work of David Hilbert in Germany. This was a tremendous impression on everybody. So that's what I think they were all reacting about. And that's the context where Carnap was in. That's all I wanted to say. Thank George, you. George, could you possibly put those names into the chat for those people who couldn't? <laughs> if I could figure out how to work it, yes, I haven't used it yet. But no. I don't think everybody could hear the names exactly. Here, okay. I, here I go. Um, I see. OK. Thank you. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah, so it would be great if anyone has, even if it's just a general straightforward question about or comment about um, learning and classroom practice or about knowledge, um, it would be nice to bring it back to some of those practical questions, especially if um, we have anyone who hasn't um, said anything so far in a meeting. And you're welcome to type it if you um, are unable or um, would rather not say it on the microphone. Nobody else wants to speak. I want to come back to your question about uh, the paper and the screen. Um, because I think, uh, as Anje also pointed out already, there is something going on in this text in the background in Yelienkov's text which has to do with uh, intermediality and intermodality. Um, and I think these are also the questions we addressed before when we talked about what is book uh, knowledge and how does it translate and how does it refer to the world and so on. These are all quite interesting uh, questions in the background of this text, but are not addressed. Uh, in terms of your example, 
I think it's uh, interesting, but that's just an ad hoc uh, <laughs> I guess. Um, it's interesting that it's the case. First of all, I think uh, everybody can somehow agree. Um, I was wondering if we would even be able to ask this question, for example, in terms of intermediality uh, or intermodality. I think what's rather the case is that something printed has more authority. So it's it's also a matter of of habit. So for example, yeah. everything today is even even with administration, everything is uh, by email. But if it's important, you get a letter. <laughs> you know, like then you know, okay, now it's uh, now it's for real. Uh, so that's that's quite interesting. But maybe more an uh, invitation for a historical materialism of media or something like that mm -hmm. than. Uh, a kind of embodied uh, or mm -hmm. media or theory there. Mm -hmm. I'd like to, so I think for some people, precisely for the reason you say, Sasha, because it's official, when exactly. you, the minute you see the paper, you don't even want to look at it. You don't want to treat it, <laughs> you want to reject it because it's, because it is what it is. And, I, and I, I'd like to go back to Kirill's example of the blocks because um, the, difference between seeing a graph on paper that, and having the block in your hand, the huge importance of that difference. Now, I, I thought that was really amazing example because um, it's the three dimensionality that the physical presence of something that you can hold and keep. Whereas if you listening to somebody speak, that's a time, it disappears into space. What Kirill said, we can't grab it anymore, it's, it's in the past. We can't put our finger on it, but we can put our finger on the block. We can touch it, we can hold it, we can keep it for five minutes or even an hour. And it's the time, it's like a sculpture, isn't it? It's a three dimensional, not just visually, but physically in, in time. And I think that's what makes it more impact, has more impact on us. And in addition to like a statue that comes to life is even more dramatic than a statue that isn't alive. Mm. You know, the famous Pygmalion story is that's why it's such a magical thing because mm -hmm. not only is it three dimensional, but it's also moving. So, I mean, it's like the difference between the written word and a film, isn't it? The film is, has more attractive power than a, a book for most people now, not everybody, but. I just, I think the um, that relates it then to Ilyenkov's idea of the you know the drawing of the circle, that the physical movement in space and time means that you understand it in a, a more deeper subconscious way as well as a conscious way. Right. Uh, but I, I'd like to, if there's anybody again that hasn't spoken, <laughs> the floor is yours. That that was very helpful. Yeah. I guess we'll have one more opportunity if anyone does have a final comment or question or query after um, Andre next. Okay, go ahead. And because you know, I still I still think about this text and a little bit what Corina says, but you know, when you have more general thinking, what is dialectic in the terms how it deals with the reaction to the modernity. It's of course, when you go to back to Hegel, you know, the most general, general term is trying to save the modernity, you know, what we get from modernity together with this kind of, of what we lost with modernity. It means that this kind of organic, holistic, way of being, you know, like like understanding. You know, it's trying to be kind of a holy grail, yes, that we we are modern, it means we are not romantic and then we are not Dreyfus, yes, but then we are a little bit strange because we are trying to save it. And this is very general remark. And then when I, you know, I put that I am still using this very old fashioned seminar, for example, I have this today. 
Because I was learned by all quite old fashioned Polish philosophers like or sociologists like Kozil Kowalski, very old school Marxist, that when we have a seminar, it, it was like six hours, for example, or four. My PhD professor, my PhD seminars, it was like I, on the beginning, the people drank uh, some kind of <laughs> beer and smoked cigarettes. And then it, this went to past because it was a little bit strange because the university evolved. But then we only have coffee and we have this kind of a very old fashioned six hour, five hour seminars, you know, that we have to discuss, for example, my PhD uh, project until, let's say, my death, you know, I was completely empty in my head after such kind of a experience. And this one, I learned this kind of, let's say, very old school, organic, let's say, practical knowledge production. And what I when I read this text, I a little bit like have it like I still find this opposition book practice false because we were only able to have this six hour seminars because we have internalization of the bookish knowledge. We you know as the same with Ilyenkov. We he he read Hegel in German and Hegel in Russian and Hegel in everywhere. And only because he internalized a thousand of pages of Hegel. He was able to conduct, for example, practical lecture. And this is not the Dreyfus way of thinking, but, and then for me, this, we have, I think this is something which could be a little bit simplified when we put too much emphasis on this practical thinking only as a piece of wood on my table, you know, like having, being able to have object of knowledge and able to, for example, translate them in the discussion, even it is five hours. It's not against the book, yes? It is that the book is lived like because you are able to enact and I hear really using this enact very strictly here, that yes? But it doesn't mean that this book is not in me somehow. And I think this is not visible in the text. But I think it it is not against this. The text is not against. But but I I I was a little afraid that we can somehow miss it. Yes, yeah? that and be too, a little bit too Heideggerian in this mean that only hammers are uh, important, you know. And we, mm. we 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 lose all let's say dialectical mm -hmm. uh, right. how we call it sensibility. Yeah. No, it's a, it's. I I think that's a good uh, point. Uh... I, I think uh, Kyrill already mentioned that in his in his uh, criticism. Um, I, I would uh, disagree only on the description of uh, your six hours colloquia, because it seems to me rather, um, you know, okay, some some kind of um, verbalism is presupposed, but what was going on was not using that, but destroying that. It sounds more like a, a Zen session where the master says it's all wrong what you are thinking. And that's exactly, you know, the kind of cathartic effect it, it can have. Okay, I don't know nothing. Uh, I, and, and I think that's exactly what happens in this. I, I, I know uh, uh, I had the chance to have had these have this kind of old school <laughs> discussions. It's really like they uh, people like mostly older people then, um, they can totally destroy your image of what you thought you were thinking. Uh, and it, But as a productive uh, uh, way, of course, because they, do you really know? That's what they are asking, right? And I think this is what you meant. So in yes, a way- it's just, it, This is a process, you know, you, you, this is like a distraction. This is not distraction. It's like a process. I got the good psychological session that the proper, psychological therapist is, you know, destroying you and putting together on the end. And it, it's yeah. supposed to be the good seminar, you know, like destroying, but the putting together on the end, not just just the mocking the guy who is younger. No, 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 of course. But, but, uh, but what I mean that we have to have, you have to have a clear image what you want to think on right to be able to defend this on life with the person and exchange ideas. And for example, on one last question. One week ago, we have a old Professor Emeritus, Barbara Kotova, very also old school Marxist, and he asked question to one of the PhDs. 
And I was, I was completely amazed. She was able to construct one or maybe two or three minutes question long with one very complex sentence. And she was all, all able to control the way how she answered this very complicated, very, you know, intertwined, you know, with the think questions, having this very training that she has to be able so, so to operate on this practical level, being able to enact this complicated thinking within the live discussion. It was, you know, like something really, which was a training, you know, we have to be able to put this knowledge in action. And what I mean, you know, like what I saw in this Ilyenkov text is that the knowledge is in action. You know, this is maybe I prefer than practical. Okay. So if in 60 seconds, Sigurd, you could say what you were saying, then great. Otherwise, we do need to close. I only uh, <clears throat> would, uh, it's so fascinating to to listen to Anje, uh, this um, um, uh, experiences uh, from uh, from uh, Polish academies and so on. So it's, it's only that uh, in, in these seminars reading uh, Ilyenkov, uh, uh, what is happening also is that um, I mean, it's only a question to Anja. We, we don't have the time to go into it. But but are you sort of ex uh, describing a kind of um, East European dialectical culture, which is uh, a bit uh, different <laughs> from what we experience here in, 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 in the Western Europe? That's a that's a <laughs> big question, but yeah. but it's uh, but it's uh, it's. Um, it's not <laughs> no. no because uh, if you come uh, if you would go to Poland today you would not see a big difference to to Norway so it's a it's a expression of a different kind of culture which also is not only um, you know um, it's more like you know I have a chance to experience something from the past and just one question when I went first time to US and I was trying to recreate my this my habit I, I and then it was a seminar with Sandra Harding. And I have this kind of, you know, habit to have a have harsh question. And my colleague from from India, in, Indian Marxist, say me, you know, to to ear whisper me, you know, I all I also when I was first time in 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 state, I have this kind of habit. But if you want to survive here, you have to change your habit, you know. And then I learned that I have to ask the question, you know, this is the completely different culture. And now we we didn't have a time the time for this, you know. We even don't read each other uh, any longer in the department. Only you know, parish, publish, and parish culture. And this mm -hmm. is you know, this is not, not. This is why I mentioned the professor emeritus. You know, like like this is the this this is when I read about Nienko. Sorry that I I feel this this kind of a background. You know, sitting and chatting. Mm -hmm. Even of course, it has this bad. Uh, it could be the bad, like the Ilyenkov mocked by these awful guys, the zombie guys in the in the. Yeah. Yeah. But that, the Ilyenkov discussions were done privately. They weren't done in the public. Most of them were done in his closed circle in his house. So that was it. You know, that was the the culture they had. It was an anti culture actually against the official ones. Anyway, I, I think Carol wants to say a few words, and then we'll have to close. Oh, yeah, just uh, th thank you very much for all of your contributions. That, that was a very rich discussion. I think we together uh, made lots of interesting insights and gained new knowledge. Um, and we hope many of you can join us um, in April for our um, collaboration with Museum of Care, talking about uh, Lienkov's essay, What is a Personality? And I'll also maybe bring back some of the conversations we've been having over the last two meetings. Thanks. Thanks, Carol. And just finally, we will share the, the chat, so don't worry, you can get those links. And also to say, if you've got any any of you who ways in which we could, you know, improve the connectivity in, or the way in which we do these discussions to encourage everybody to take part, um, because even if somebody only has a one sentence, it would be very valuable to to incorporate that in the discussion. And I, I think Carol and I were going to try and do if we can some, you know, your suggestions about how to have the maximum participation would be most appreciated. So 
feel free to send any criticisms or any things you found negative or positive about the way that we do these these semi these webinars because obviously it's it's i mean the the the, the opening what Carol said at the beginning about this collaborative, practical way of working together and developing new ideas is, you know, it's what we're aspiring to, not just regurgitating things that we know. So anyway, th thank you everybody. It was a fantastic discussion. Thank you all for thank taking you. part. Thanks, bye everyone. Bye.